Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and I'm here with my co-host, Meher Roy. Today, we're speaking with Avril Dudheil, also known as Spade, who is the general manager of Neutron. Neutron is the first consumer chain secured by the Cosmos Hub via interchain security and is focused on providing secure interchain DeFi via Cosmos and smart contracts. Welcome, Avril, to Epicenter. Hey, folks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, great to have you, and congrats on the recent launch. I think very big milestone for Cosmos at large, and we're, as, as many people know, Epicenter hosts and people are quite uh, hyped about Cosmos generally. And so, yeah, we're, we're glad to have you on and would love to hear first, as, as it's custom, about your background, how you, how you got into crypto, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, for sure. Um I think there's 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 a few things, right? Like there's part of it was kind of random. Just uh, a friend, you know, told me about you know, hey, there's this uh, electronic cash system called Bitcoin that you know um, that exists now, and you should look into it. And at the time, I had been um, looking quite deeply into um, a lot of privacy related like concerns in in society and in the current technological stack that that we use for our day to day operations. Um, and you know the like Snowden revelations and such had made me pretty um, wary and untrust. Like I, I wasn't trusting ex established int institutions and big companies um, tremendously. And so you know the fact that one it was unmediated um, value exchange and that it was at the time at least considered um, pseudonymous and so therefore pretty good for your privacy um, were two of the things that initially drove my interest into it. And so I ended up like reading the the white paper and like finding it like finding it kind of fascinating. Although you know, um, I think at that time I was still in high school, um, and so just bought some Bitcoin at that point. I think on Coinbase or something. Um, but then you know, life happened, um, and I and I got back to things around the time where um, DeFi summer was a thing. Um, that sort of brought me back into into the ecosystem because now it wasn't just hey, I, we can send this asset back and forth. It was also that we can make um, programmable you know, applications that live on the blockchain entirely, have the same properties, um, but the use cases are like way more diverse. And so that that brought me back entirely into the space. And I basically started having you know my day job uh, plus my nighttime crypto job, I guess, of researching how these things worked and um, what could be built on top of them. Um, that led me to become more and more active uh, on chain and in like Web3 communities, um, some on Ethereum like Lido, but also some on, on on Terra with a bunch of the protocols that were there. I ran some AMA, well, I helped with some AMAs of Anchor Protocol, the infamous um, back in the days. But in any case, that eventually led me to, you know, like a pretty random thing, right? Which was that, you know, Lido on Terra was going to do an upgrade and they posted about it in the anchor forum and the last line said something like hey by the way if you think you have skills that we could use just like get in touch with us on on dms right and so i did and so we started having like calls and stuff and a few months uh, later i joined the the team initially as a community manager um and our team at that time was very strong on the technical side we had like a lot of very very um skilled and knowledgeable engineers but we lacked a lot of like the the software functions like business development, marketing, and all of these things, like nobody wanted to do it. That's not what people, you know, were good at. And so, you know, from community manager, just like managing social medias, I started doing more and more of these things, basically became, I guess, head of marketing. So like de facto, and then head of growth, handling some of the business development for the project as well. Um, and so that's sort of like how I eventually um, was asked to basically, hey, do, do you want to actually lead the team, um, which is what I do now and what I've been doing for um, for quite some time now. Um, so it's you know it's pretty random sort of life journey, but it has been you know an honor, but also um, something that has taught me a whole lot. So that has been really really cool to go through. All right. So so basically, initially you were working mostly on Lido on Terra, and then. That fell apart, and or or was it like you switched to Neutron? Was it already its own team, or or how about that? Yeah, so like our team built Light on Terra, like built the architecture, the code that ran Light on Terra in the past. Um, and the thing is, like while we were doing this, like Light Lido on Terra was the second most successful implementation of Lido uh, beyond Ethereum, 
it was like before the Terra crash, it was about a $10 billion TBL protocol. So it was like a pretty massive protocol, actually. And so, you know, that, that was a big part uh, of the work. We were conducting like onboarding phases for validators and such. So like that, that was a big part of the work. But it, like aside to this, right, there was the fact that the protocol was really big on, on, on Terra, but Terra was, you know, in our head, you know, part of this wider Cosmos ecosystem, but it wasn't very well connected with it. And because, you know, there's quite a bunch of proof of stake chains in, in Cosmos, like the ecosystem is made of, of them. It made a lot of sense to try and, and allow the protocol to um, to scale and basically provide services for these other blockchains as well. The problem was that you know the like so we basically started doing a lot of research on like hey how do we expand this protocol and make it available across chains basically. And at the time the sort of like easy answer was like hey you take the small contracts and you redeploy them wherever you can, but that doesn't really scale. And most of the Cosmos blockchain don't even have small contract capabilities. So the the model was like flawed, right? We, we There needed to be another sort of like um, playbook for how you actually do cross-chain applications in, in Cosmos. And so that's sort of the, the research that led us to develop Neutron in, at, at the end of the day, right? The three sort of like pain points that we were faced with was one, um, a lot of these blockchains lacked security, um, like economic security. And that meant that, you know, if, if any protocol really was going to be tremendously successful and attract a lot of like TVL, it would turn into a target and potentially, you know, help justify attacks against the, the blockchain itself, which is, you know, not ideal, let's say. Um, so security was an issue. Um, the lack of cross-chain infrastructure for Cosmos and smart contracts was the other main blocker, whereby, you know, like token transfers were generally something that you could do um, at, at the time already. But, you know, ICA, so interchain accounts, which had already released, um, were very unwieldy to use. And for small contracts, you didn't have any bindings for, for your small contract to actually leverage that primitive. And so you essentially would have had to, you know, make small contracts that essentially port the code of ICA into the Cosmosm layer um, so that you essentially rebuild the, the entire infrastructure. And while, you know, that, that may be fine for one team that has, you know, a lot of bandwidth and a lot of experience with these things, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense from an architecture perspective. Like, why should every dApp basically end up recreating the infrastructure that they need to 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 do crushing stuff basically like that should have been part um either of ibc or like sort of like the the platform that the small contracts were on um and then the last one was also that you know Ter terra had a very strong community it was like you know like a lot of big blockchains um like solana and then ethereum and such was pretty tribal and as a result it didn't really um it wasn't very homogeneous with cosmos right and so if you had uh, primitive going from Terra to the rest of the ecosystem, the chances that the immune system of the Cosmos ec ecosystem would actually repel that primitive, fight against it, or don't want to adopt it too willingly were high. And sort of the other way around as well, right? Like Cosmos primitives were tricky to adopt on the Terra ecosystem as well, right? Beyond Osmosis, which actually um, was eventually fairly well adopted. So, you know, finding some way to have either one of credible neutrality or sort of like ecosystem alignment by default was something that was also important. And so that's those are kind of like the, the early premises that let us develop Neutron the way it is today, um, whereby, you know, of the three problems, security, crushing infrastructure, and credible alignment, one in three are actually solved by replicated security. We have very high economic security from the box, thanks to, you know, all of the stake, and all of the validators of the Cosmos Hub. And we also have very strong alignment with the Cosmos Hub itself, right? And so, you know, if you're a part of Cosmos, you probably have interest in the Cosmos Hub remaining your leading blockchain, a very strong blockchain, and sort of like the the the, the shelling point for the ecosystem. And so, you know, replicated security solves one and three. And then the crashing infrastructure was the remaining problem. And so that's that's why we focused on on this one and we implemented um, interchain transaction module, which is essentially a way to make it very um, easily accessible for smart contracts to use interesting accounts um, and more. So basically you can you know register accounts on other blockchains, execute transactions, retrieve execution status, and do callbacks as well. Um, so you know you can have sequences of actions that uh, execute across chains. Um, and the interesting uh, queries module, which allows you to retrieve data directly from the storage of other blockchains, right over IBC. So you know we like replicated security solves two of our problems and then we developed the solution to 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 solve the um the other one and we think that this together basically makes sort of the ideal package to build 
crushing applications that can scale across the entire Cosmos ecosystem in, in a way that's uh, more viable than it used to be, let's say. So um, for our listeners that may not have followed the Cosmos ecosystem a lot, could you actually give an example of a cross-chain application? Uh, so maybe one example, like in, in theory, where where we go like maybe three or four years in the future and say, okay, this is what a cross-chain application on Cosmos could do. And then maybe one example more in practice, which is like, here's the top cross-chain application that is live today and, and what, it, what it can do. It may be primitive, but it kind of demonstrates the point. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So, I think I like there's a few, like depending on the type of protocol you're building, your your architecture is going to be different. I think a, a, a pretty good example in general is um, you know we talked about Lido a bit, but let's say let's imagine like Russian liquid staking, right? Because that's sort of like where the idea for Neutron came from. So might as well. So the way you could build it is essentially something like it, it could look something like the following: you would have a set of small contracts on one blockchain, Neutron in this case, um, and that set of small contract we could contain all of the business logic as well as all of the cross-chain management logic now um this product like this set of small contracts could um you know through either governance or through a multi-sig or what have you it could accept a transaction that allows it to register a set of ibc channels and create a set of accounts on another blockchain so that it can start like it can onboard that blockchain to liquid staking basically and once that's done so that's that's like you know, expanding to a new blockchain instead of having you redeploy contracts and make changes and such, it becomes one transaction, right? You just trigger that happening at the protocol level and it does, and, and then that's that's mainly it. Um, and then once once that's done, basically you can have the same UI for the user. Um, you know, you have one UI that you go to that has whatever the protocol brand is, um, and they can choose whatever asset they want to stake. Probably they're auto detected by their wallet, e.g. let's say I connect to that liquid staking protocol, I have Atom, it proposes like it, it can offer me to stake that atom, but if I also have Osmo and that chain has been onboarded to the liquid staking protocol, it auto detects that I can have this and maybe I can stake both at the same time. But what happens in the background is basically, you know, if my atom is on the Cosmos hub or my Osmo on Osmo, um, there's essentially two ways to do it. Like the way that uh, liquid staking protocols like Stride, for example, do it currently is that they essentially build a transaction that allow you to transfer all of this to their blockchain and then they'll eventually end up doing the staking operations by sending them back to their native chains and staking them. Um, with interesting accounts and ICQs, you can do that. Like that's very uh, easy to do actually, especially with you know the improvements in UX and um, and APIs that are available today in Cosmos. But um, but you can also do it in a slightly different manner whereby instead of having to do an IBC transfer, the user would simply on the same blockchain send the asset to an account that the protocol controls. And the protocol will be able to verify that it has received the deposit using an interesting query, basically, right? It could, oh, that or just sending a message or like there's multiple ways to implement it, but the protocol is able to verify that basically. And so as soon as the protocol knows that it has received custody of the asset that needs to be staked, it knows because it knows the exchange rate, how many of the derivatives, it, like the, the sorry, the liquid staking tokens it needs to send you, right? So basically, as soon as it confirms the deposit, it can send the, 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 the token directly to the user's wallet, either on the chain where the main business logic of the protocol exists or on the other chain where the user had their asset, right? That, that's something that the user can, can choose. Basically, the, the protocol itself is able to just do the transfer itself if, if needed. Like that's sort of like what happens in the background, right? You have one, the user deposits tokens into an account that's controlled by the protocol, and then the protocol can... Um, verify the deposit, and then the protocol can manage that that um, collateral. For example, by staking it, and it can you know redelegate actively by verifying the state of uh, the blockchain to know what are the performances, various metrics of the of the, the validators, and just like moving stake according to its validator set like management policy. Um, so basically, all of this works across chain. And then from the user's perspective, it's actually really easy. It's I log into one website, I um, connect my wallet. It detects what assets I have there, tells me which ones I can stake with that protocol. I select that, click it, and maybe there's one, two, or three transactions that pop on my screen and just co confirm them, and then I get the derivative. Um, so that's kind of like the whole point of this, right, is that it abstracts away all of the need to move from one blockchain to the other that currently exists in Cosmos, um, although new apps are a lot better at this um, than, than, than previously they were. 
Um, but it removes all of that crush and complexity, basically. It makes it so that there's one product. If you want to interact with it, you just go to the website and connect your wallet. Yeah. So, so the way I'm, I'm kind of imagining this is um, one of the raw technologies that is kind of, that is not maybe even neutron specific, but is, is there because of the way Cosmos chains can communicate with each other. Is this idea of an interchain account where if you have like blockchain A, and blockchain B, you can imagine an interchain account on blockchain B as just being a normal address for blockchain B. It's, it looks like a normal address to blockchain B, but it, that address is not controlled by a private key as such, but by the entire blockchain A itself. So it can be controlled by the entire blockchain A itself, or it can be controlled by some smart contract that's written on blockchain A. Both modalities are kind of possible. In in Cosmos in general, you don't really have the the opportunity for smart contracts to control one of these accounts. Only the blockchain itself can do it, right? And so right. like that's one of the things that that we had to do for Neutron to enable a smart contract to control an account. Um, we we did need like basically the the authentication logic still lives in the blockchain itself, right? But now your smart contract has a way to tell the blockchain, hey I want you to register an account on that other blockchain that I will control, essentially. Um, so so that, that's one of the things that Neutron brings to the table, basically. So, yeah. So, I mean, if, if you think of like, you think of right at the start, if you think like Bitcoin, then Bitcoin, normal like, if you had like a very early Bitcoin address, it was an address controlled by one private key. Then in Bitcoin came the next generation, which is like the multi-sig, where it's like, okay, it's one address, by it, but controlled by three or five or seven private keys. And then like Ethereum kind of like generalized that to say that, okay, you can have an address, which now is called a smart contract. And then behind that uh, behind that address is not private keys at all, but rather some like code and and data, like logic and, and data, and that's controlling like that an address. And this this is like kind of like a further generalization of that. Maybe not generalization, maybe the not right word, but a new type of interaction where you can have an address living on a blockchain, but it's controlled by another blockchain altogether. Or by a smart contract on another blockchain, yes. <laughs> or, or by a smart contract on another uh, another blockchain. So kind of like interchain accounts. Yeah, it's even like you can have multiple accounts on multiple blockchains all being controlled by the same smart contract on one blockchain, um, which is kind of cool, uh, in my opinion. Exactly. So like you can imagine that this kind of like, like the generalization of basically single SIG address, multi SIG address, smart contract, interchain account is like a blockchain itself controlling addresses on other blockchains and then a smart contract on that blockchain controlling lots of addresses on on other blockchains so really like that's one way to kind of like think of an interchain account another way to think of an interchain account could well be that sometimes like people are used to the idea of a uh, custody service right like so you 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 want to go to a custody service and have the custody service generate some private keys and manage your private keys. And then uh, the custody service will kind of interact with various dApps on your behalf. And so what kind of a Cosmos chain, like interchain accounts or Cosmos chains fundamentally allow you to do is to is to think, is to build a distributed custody service in a way where um, you can imagine like a Cosmos chain is like a decentralized network, but because it can create addresses on other networks and and you can load those addresses with with funds you can start to imagine like a cosmos chain or neutron specifically as like a distributed custodian of assets on on multiple networks so do you think that imagination also works i think that works i think you could build an application that does that uh, on on neutron for example or i think you could even make um, you know, an app chain that focuses on doing this um, entirely, and in which case you would be able to, I mean, in both cases, you would be able to, you know, build some safety mechanisms and such in, 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 into the code itself as well. Um, 
So I'm pretty sure I've heard somebody at a conference recently talk about basically just like their thought processes on doing exactly that. So, you know, that's that's like to to tie this back to Neutron is like Neutron was not designed to do only this, but it would certainly provide tools that would allow you to build this if you wanted to. And I do think that that technology can be used to to build exactly that at scale, actually. Um, so it's it's a pretty interesting so like thought experiment. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe we can imagine Neutron is kind of like this kind of like orchestrator chain where I can go and write a smart contract and I can kind of orchestrate assets on multiple Cosmos networks via by using these interchain queries and, 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 and kind of interchain accounts. One example that's particularly interesting here is an idea that was... Um, you know, developed and published by Delphi Labs with the, um, what they call the shared liquidity AMM, the SLAM. Basically, what it, it sort of like the the thought process that they had there is that they were looking at you know like Uniswap and initially it was you know it's it's one AMM on one chain that has its liquidity there and you can trade through that pool, right? And then we had another generation of DEXs um, like you know Curve, Sushi, and others that started launching on other chains as well, right? So now you have, it can be the same pool or, or different pools depending on what assets are available, but basically you have you know numerous pools on numerous networks, each with their own liquidity, right? And then the problem with that is that it's not particularly capital efficient because perhaps you have a lot of liquidity for Ethereum on Ethereum, but if you want to have so, at, you know as much liquidity for that on another network, you'll need to you know, compensate for the change in trust assumptions, for per, 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 for the efforts required with moving that liquidity extra, extra, uh, so that the LPs are actually interested in providing that on another network as well, right? And so what you end up having is that you don't necessarily have a great match between the demand for various assets on each deployment and the uh, liquidity that's available, right? Because that liquidity may be Maybe it's in a pool in that protocol somewhere on some chain, but it you know there's no guarantee that it will be on the right pool so that you don't have a great degree of guarantee that just because that DEX is liquid on Ethereum, it is also on the chain that you're trying to use it in. And so from there, there is sort of like another generation of, of DEXs that tried to essentially have the DEX function in such a way whereby you would have a deployment on each chain and all of these deployments uh, would be connected in a way whereby each of them would uh, behave as if it had the aggregate liquidity of the system as a whole, right? That's a very appealing perspective because now it's you know fully capital efficient. It doesn't matter where people are depositing their 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 liquidity and such. Wherever you're trading, you're going to benefit from it. Basically, the problem with that though is that because there is some latency between you know whatever rebalancing operations may occur between the the various deployments, that means that there's you know plenty of opportunities for arbitrageurs to come in and basically arb the pools and take the value before the the protocol itself has the chance to rebalance itself as a whole, right? Um, and so what, what that led is that basically the impermanent loss becomes extremely dramatic for LPs and that sort of killed the, the primitive. Um, and so Delphi kind of like, you know, looked into all of these and they postulated uh, the idea that you could still take the idea of that improvement where, whereby you want to um, connect these deployments so that they provide um, the optimal training um, experience for traders and um, are as capital efficient as possible, but make it in a way where you don't get that like bad trade-off of you know like losing uh, liquidity to arbitrage. Um, and what they came up with was the idea that you could have a DEX that has all of its deployments connected, um, and then dy dynamically allocates its liquidity across pools on the various networks based on demand. Right when the easier way to do this is basically you actually physically move the LPs around, um, like the, the assets around uh, via IBC or, or another bridging protocol, and you use um, sort of like a reactive algorithm so that you're, for example, using interchain queries to um, observe sort of like the use usage data on the chain, right? Uh, how many transactions are there trying to swap for X asset or how many, you know, what's the volume or all of these metrics, right? You can retrieve them with an ICQ. And then you can have an algorithm that just reacts to the changes in 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 this usage to basically reallocate liquidity accordingly. Um, that's one way that you can do it. But the the paper basically um, tried to show that if you know even if it's not going to be accurate one hundred percent of the time, there are good chances that you can make algorithms 
that are actually good enough to most of the time predict accurately um, where the liquidity will be needed. And so by u- using that as an input rather than you know just reacting to the protocol, you can essentially dynamically move that liquidity around. And another improvement that you can do is like instead of actually physically moving the assets every time, perhaps you can just have a centralized accounting of what liquidity is in the system and then allow the various satellites to essentially you know take on debt against each other and then settle with assets when required because the the you know there's not enough liquidity to honor a trade or you're approaching some threshold as such. So that at the end of the day, you're minimizing the cost of the entire protocol by not having to have you know like token transfers and such uh, too frequently, and you're maximizing how close you can get to the uh, to the ideal scenario of you know the the liquidity of the protocol is used on on all things right so it's a compromise towards that first version but at least it's not vulnerable to to the same attacks and with you know architecture like a, like infrastructure like what neutron provides it actually becomes a lot more manageable to build stuff like this and so i think you know you, you asked me before about um what's a good, good example to understand what you can do with this um, the liquid staking example is an easy one, in my opinion, because it's pretty simple. You have, you know, one account, you accept deposits, you send the, the, the derivatives. And then the slam, in my opinion, is um, a really good example of the change in experience that we may experience by, um, like in user experience that we may see by, um, you know, witnessing the, the, the appearance of like Russian protocols over the next few years, basically. Uh, whereas it doesn't matter where you're interacting with this protocol with, you can sort of get the best out of it anyway, because it sort of manages itself as, um, you know, one body rather than separate segregated deployments. Yeah, that's 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 really cool. So yeah, so essentially, like the the superpower that you can give developers is that they ultimately have to write a smart contract and deploy it on the neutron chain, but. That smart contract can control accounts on on a lot of different networks, and it can optimize kind of liquidity across a lot of different networks, which could be important in in like various applications. So I think there's a few benefits, right? Like the first one is like as you said, you can optimize liquidity across multiple networks. Um, I think another uh, one of the key benefits is that you can um, you can provide a crushing experience that doesn't feel like a crushing experience, right? Because no, no, no one likes to be changing the chain in their wallet or stuff. Like all of these extra steps, they're just burdensome. They should be removed eventually. For IBC to win, it needs to be completely, you know, like like you don't think about TCP/IP when you're using the internet. It just should be the same for I, for IBC, right? Cool. IBC wins when we're able to make, um, you know, front like like consumer facing products that are completely. Uh, you know, re- removed from the actual com- intricacies of the of the crash intra- infrastructure that underlies them, right? So basically, you know, Neutron's infrastructure allows you to, well, first build crashing protocols, right? Which was a lot trickier before. And it allows you to do it without having to redeploy, like recreate a lot of like infrastructure because they come so like key in hand for you, basically. You already have the bindings to use them. Um, but but it also, yeah, so UX benefits. And I think sort of like the emergent property of this is that it sorts of um, flipped the script of the playbook for how you make a successful um, small contract platform, right? Like um, traditionally, if you, you know, like I'm building a small contract platform, I want all of the liquidity, all of the users, and I want all of the apps uh, on top of my network to be exclusive to my network because that's how I maximize the appeal of my network to you know the broader uh, audience and 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 the potential user base right now with with neutron because it allows you to actually create interoperable crushing protocols it sort of flips flip, flips the switch in that we actually need other projects and other app chains to be successful so that there are markets to interoperate like markets and app chains uh, to interoperate with right and what what it does is that it basically allows from the perspective of the developers, instead of having to choose a platform by virtue of its specific um, market and market size and its specific feature set, it allows you to essentially deploy on Neutron so that you don't have to choose, right? So for example, if I'm really interested in in fast execution for parts of my protocol, um, I can deploy on Neutron and then leverage say for some of these interactions if i'm interested in privacy for some of like some other part of my protocol let's say i want to do sealed bid auctions or private voting perhaps i can just deploy an enclave on like secret network and then you know anonymize some of the traffic going into my application so that i basically leverage their features 
um, without, you know, in, in a way that's not like exclusive, right? I can deploy on Neutron and leverage the features of these multiple blockchains, but also because it makes it easier for me to bring my application to market on these blockchains as well. I'm no, I'm no longer constrained by the market size, e.g., the you know the amount of, of value on Neutron and the number of users on Neutron. I can now also, you know, with the same deployment, I can also tap into the liquidity and user basis of other blockchains and other projects. Right. Yeah. But you are basically still limited by the support for interchain accounts or like IBC in like, but you can tap into this entire ecosystem versus just the single, which is yeah. For IC specifically, yeah, um, there there are some dependencies in Cosmos though. Like ICAs are pretty well adopted. Um, a lot of a lot of chains have the like ICAs have sort of two sides to that to them. There is the uh, controller side, which allows you to register accounts on other chains, and then there's the whole host side. Um, there's not that many chains that have the controller functionality enabled, but but most of them actually have the um, the host chain enabled, which means that Neutron can register accounts on them. Right. Do, do you expect that to change? Like many chains will become or will try to become sort of this controller chain since if you are the, like what are the benefits if you're the controller chain? Like the assets like sort of go through you, I guess you can sort of capture value there. I think it really depends on the project, right? Um, if you don't have a use for your protocol to be doing stuff on other blockchains or or maintaining assets on other chains, then there's no point in you having the the controller functionality. Like in Neutron's case, that was important because you know the assumption is that developers building small contract applications that that want to expand cross chain will want their small contracts to actually control some of these things, right? So it was a requirement rather than than a, really a choice. Um, but but for other applications. Um, you know, you, you may want to use it. For example, let's say I'm a I'm a lending and borrowing protocol like Umi. Um, maybe I want to use. Um, maybe I want to have the ability to send tokens to an enclave that I control, an account that I control on another chain to be able to liquidate through existing public liquidity on an AMM or such. Um, and so, you know, I could use interchain accounts to do that. But now, is that the most efficient way that I can liquidate? Well, that's not a given, right? Because IBC and especially today is still um, you know, it's asynchronous and it's relatively slower than um, than what you can do on one blockchain, right? Because you do need to wait for multiple blocks to be passed for the entire sequence of events to unfold. Um, so that may be a good solution, but potentially there's a better way to do it, right? And for example, like Umi currently, um, to, to the extent that I, uh, to the extent of my knowledge, um, what they do is instead they auction off the collateral on Umi so that the cross chain. Um, transfers are not handled by Umi, and they don't have to wait for that. They just, you know, they just do the auction, and whoever is the fastest gets gets the bonus, essentially. Um, so, you know, th there are trade offs here, especially in terms of speed today. Although I expect that this will become um, a lot less burdensome in the future because block time hasn't mattered so much in Cosmos so far. But as more and more applications are built upon ABC, like latency is going to become more of a friction point. And so there will be more of an incentives for change to sort of like improve in this front, in in my opinion. So I expect block time to trend lower in Cosmos because there's there's a lot of low hanging fruits in this regard. Um, but now, you know, an alternative for what Umi might be interested in having interesting accounts for is, for example, how about they allow um, users to deposit collateral from other chains, right? Like that. That's that's a lot more you know palatable for Umi, but Umi because it it basically provides. Um, easy access to the protocol um, from other chains that people might have assets and interest in, right? And so, for example, they could deploy a, an outpost on Neutron that allows folks to deposit into the protocol without having to do the ABC transfers to the UMI blockchain uh, just by sending to an account that they control on Neutron and then just moving and depositing the, the, the tokens at a periodic interval, for example, something like this. Um, so that would be possible. And in fact, that's kind of the route that Osmosis is going for. Um, it's not necessarily like ICA specific, but basically they're going, they're working on this outpost model um, where the outpost is what we call like a lean outpost. It doesn't actually hold any liquidity, uh, so it's not synchronously composable, but it sorts, it serves as like an interface, an API for protocols that want to leverage um, Osmosis. So right, so you have the smart contract, for example, on Neutron, and you know it can have a UI that allows you to use it as if it was a Dex on Neutron, or other smart contracts can interact with that smart contract to basically send calls to the Osmosis blockchain, right? So if you send it to token to do a swap, it will take that token, send it to Osmosis, um, swap that 
token, as long as your slippage metrics are, you know, are valid um, and the slippage didn't get out of hand and then return the proceeds to you basically, right? So it, it serves as like a, an API for, for osmosis essentially. Um, so there's a bunch of models that, that, that applications can take, right? From the most heavy outposts, kind of like Mars, what Mars is doing, for example, on osmosis, where the collateral um, actually lives on the blockchain where the outpost is, um, to the leaner models where, like, which Osmosis or Cosmoswap are are doing, where it's mostly an API. Right. Yeah. Super interesting. I I think yeah. We basically you you mentioned the three kind of core things that you wanted to solve or that you saw the problems in the Cosmos ecosystem. Right. I, I guess we talked mostly about the second one now, and you you mentioned like, I think ecosystem alignment and security, which are basically coming out of the box more or less through interchain security. So I guess we can dive a little bit into your, or like interchain security, you know, what is interchain security? You probably start there and we can get into like how, how you, how you adopted it, how you leverage it, but maybe, maybe we start simple and then you can sort of explain what interchain security is or replicated security. We also hear it called sometimes. So yeah, maybe give our listeners a bit of a, the basics of interchain security here. Yeah, for sure. So interchain security is a family of technologies um, from the great category of shared security in blockchain, which is essentially, you know, how do we use the same asset to secure multiple broadcast exchanges? And it's a flavor, let's say it's a category, a family that is specific to Cosmos, right? Because it leverages IBC, so interchain, interchain security. Um, now, the specific variant that currently exists in production is called replicated security. And um, the the sort of like one liner pitch for what replicated security is is it is a technology that allows the provider chain in this case today the Cosmos Hub to provide the same um, economic security that it personally enjoys like that the blockchain enjoys to another chain called a, either a partner or a consumer chain um, and it does so by leveraging its validator set and its stake and uh, IBC, right? So there's a connection between the two blockchains that allow them to exchange messages. And that allows the the sort of like proof of stake setup of there's a reward for validators doing their job and there's a punishment for them misbehaving. And we just, you know, track as we go. And as long as they validate pro properly, they get rewards. And if they misbehave, they get slashed. Um, it basically allows you to reproduce that setup, except instead of having every component um, on one chain, you have it, you have them sort of like distributed on two chains i think like it would be interesting to kind of compare and contrast like replicated security to other kind of models that are there across the ecosystem for example maybe we can start with like comparing it to polkadot so in in polkadot there's like a relay chain and then there are like para chains and then the the validators that are running the the relay chain in Polkadot are the same as those that are uh, kind of running the para chains. So, and replicated security at at a high level looks very similar. There's a set of validators that are running the Cosmos Hub, uh, and then now those same validators are also running the the Neutron chain. So it looks similar. Like, what's what's the difference between? Uh, is it just like Cosmos Hub? Just copying what Polkadot set out to do, or is there a material difference between these these two designs? No, clearly it's just a copy. Um, you know, we were a bit jealous of of Polkadot, so we just decided to to apply the playbook. No, I mean, like, I th like the first thing is like that has been in the works for quite a long time, right? So I I don't think it would be fair to say that it's uh, just the hub like copying this, but it, it as you said, like they are very similar in sort of like the um, the structure of that technology with, I guess, one, well, I, I would say like two major differences. The first one is that um, in Polkadot, it's this mechanism is, is required to join the Polkadot ecosystem. If you, you know, if you don't get your power chain um, attached to the relay chain, you basically don't have a Polkadot chain. Um, you maybe have some code, but you don't have a functioning blockchain. Whereas in Cosmos, like all of the Cosmos technologies are available for you to use and in your own project, regardless of whether or not the hub wants you to be part of the, you know, Atom Economic Zone, um, the sort of like, you know, it, like, I guess you could say the Atom Economic Zone is uh, to the Cosmos hub what 
Polkadot is to the relay chain, right? It's the ecosystem of chains around it. Um, and so like that, that's the first thing, right? Interchain security is not required to launch in, in Cosmos. And in fact, the vast majority of chains in Cosmos today don't leverage li- like interchain security at all. Um, and the second thing is in Polkadot, you have a mechanism for the onboarding of new chains that is very, very formal, e.g. there's an auction and whatever gets the most dot you know, locked into that auction is what gets uh, a, a power chain slot. Um, in Cosmos, for better or for worse, there's no formal mechanism, right? So it, it, it is, um, I guess, as usual in Cosmos, it's, it's done through governance, right? So there is um, a sort of like public negotiation process and that has, you know, trade-offs. On the one hand, it's less clear, you know, it's, the, it's, it's a lot more flexible, but it's also less clear what should be expected from there. Um, but at the same time, it also allows you a lot of flexibility because let's say um, there there's sort of three main tools that you can um, sort of like put into the, the balance to get listed on, like to get uh, onboarded into replicated security today. Uh, obviously there needs to be something in in it for the hub, for the for the, the hub and its community to vote for your chain to be onboarded. Um, and that, in my opinion, can come mostly in three ways. Um, first one, it's either if you have a token, if your project has a token, then you can allocate some of these tokens either in one go or through streaming or whatever distribution mechanism you want to the Cosmos hub, right? That's a very straightforward sort of like mechanism. The second one um, is if you if your protocol generates revenue in whatever way, um, then it can allocate a portion of that revenue. And that may be transaction fees on the network. There may be um, fees on specific operations, like for example, for DEX swap fees or, or what have you. It can be MEV revenue. It can be you know whatever you can think of. If you generate revenue, you can share, share that with the hub. And then the last thing, um, which is paradoxically, I think the strongest element early on, but also the one that is the like basically impossible to quantify. And so it's very difficult for to take that into account into the thought process is sort of the strategic value um, to the hub and to Atom as an asset that adding the project may have, right? So for example, you know, like one of the one like some of the projects that are looking, planning to onboard to replicated security in the in the in, in the short term are liquid staking app chains. So beyond the fact that these protocols through their financial services generate revenue uh, by taking cut on the liquid staking derivatives. Um, so that, that's one of the things, right? Or maybe they have a token and they allocate some to the hub. That's another mechanism. Um, the this, One of the deciding factors is that because these protocol actually handle and manage a large amount of Atom, which is crucial to the security of the Cosmos hub itself, there is a strong incentive to ensure that these chains are adequately secured so that they're not too easy to capture for somebody who would be like looking to try to do you know like a governance or economic attack on the hub, right? Because if you compromise these chains, you're going to be compromising the mechanisms like the you know the interchain accounts that control the stake on the Cosmos hub as well, and so that gives you potentially a way to lever up on the damage that you could do to, to the hub, right? And so here we have like this third lever that comes into play, whereby there's a strong strategic incentive for the hub to secure these chains, whether or not it's going to make a profit by doing so, right? Um, so there's this sort of like three categories that that apply in replicated security, and they're difficult to assess. There currently doesn't exist a formal model on exactly how to do that the right way. Um, and there's a bunch of trade-offs, e.g. one one approach um, that, that we sometimes hear is that the hub should launch as many consumer chains as possible, because this way it has it optimizes its chances of having one, two, or three unicorns in, in the batch, in which case that's a really good outcome, and it can just trim off the uh, the projects that fail over time. You know, that's one way of doing things, um, but the, the problem, the limiting factor here um, is that while that's probably technically possible, economically speaking, that implies that validators now have to run, you know, 20, 30, 40 times more infrastructure, which means that that basically closely translates to 40, 50 times the uh, the infrastructure cost, right? Running an additional blockchain in replicated security basically translates to the same cost as running another chain without replicated security, at least today. Um, and so, you know, th- that cost, that burden on the validators is currently the limiting factor to the adoption of, and growth of the number of chains on, on replicated security. And that's something that's actively being worked on by numerous teams. Like we did quite a bunch of work on this. Like we were the first one to actually push for this to be uh, modeled. Um, but 
but but there's quite a few teams like Duality, uh, a whole bunch of validators, um, Chorus One included, included um, are working on trying to push for a more sustainable or framework or model for replicated security. And there's a bunch of ideas sort of like floating around, like having different commission rates on the various blockchains, having a stipend mechanism, having different types of emissions requiring like higher thresholds of revenue share or tokens allocations to the hub, extra, extra, extra. Um, to 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 you know try and find a stable economic equilibrium for this basically. Um, now I'm like mid long term. I'm pretty optimistic that this will be found, and especially because the current flavor of interchain security that we're talking about, replicated security, is um, sort of like the first iteration of the technology, which um, enforces that all validators, with a few caveats, we can touch upon them like later, but basically all of the validators of the Cosmos Hub have to run every consumer chain that is whitelisted by governance. And with a few caveats, uh, like again, but basically um, that means that there's no way for the validators to basically manage their exposure to the cost of, of consumer chains and the revenues that they, or, or rewards that they may generate, right? Um, in in a upcoming you know version of that technology, um, which I think is dubbed uh, opt-in security, validators would have the ability to decide whether or not they want to secure these chains. Um, that can create sort of like game theoretical problems whereby um, if you had the first validator by voting power opting in with just two validators from the bottom of the set opting in, you would end up in a situation where the voting power on that consumer chain is basically like more than 70% is owned by the top validator and the, the other validators are basically irrelevant to the consensus. So there needs to be some guardrails in place to avoid such a situation from from occurring um but 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 that should make it a lot more manageable to onboard new chains to ICS because now you know validators that are generating more profits on on their initial activity of securing the hub have probably stronger shoulders to secure more chains and enable the hub to potentially accrue value this way whereas smaller validators could just opt out of some of these chains um, and therefore not incur any additional cost, which would allow them to, you know, stay stable in the set, which basically like would protect the hub from sort of like the main concern about replicated security and its economic model today, which is that if not addressed, it may create some centralizing vectors whereby the cost on smaller players would force them to um, either go bankrupt or drop out of the set because they weren't they wouldn't be able to um, to support that that added cost basically. Um, so that, that's sort of like the, the the limiting factor to replicated security. And as a result of this, um, I think strategically and um, and sort of like pragmatically as well, what's likely to happen and to be the best scenario for the hub in the short, medium term is actually to be very selective um, of the chains that it actually launches for two reasons. The first one is like, there's this whole economic thing, right? Whereby you want every project that actually gets launched on, on replicated security to be tremendously successful to actually make up for the initial cost that it will generate because there's a, a mismatch in time for when the cost and the revenue um, are materialized, right? The, the cost starts from day one, whereas the revenue sort of like gradually comes in, right? Like that can change with token allocations, which can be pretty meaningful from the get-go, but still. Um, so that's, that's the first argument. The second one being that because you need these chains to be tremendously successful, um, and you want them to have as much synergy as possible, um, and you want to be betting on like the the you know the chains, the projects that will move the needle the most. And so, uh, one of the scenarios that could potentially be a losing scenario is to actually early on at least establish um, competition within the atom economic zone itself, right? Whereby instead of competing for growing the pie of the atom economic zone, the project would be basically fighting for you know, the, the whatever is available to them, like atom liquidity and such, uh, beyond them, like between themselves, right? And that's that's sort of like um, negative EV for, for everyone involved. Um, but if, you know, with that strategic approach of like carefully vetting and being selective of, of projects initially before we have better technology, better frameworks for assessing the economic um, value propositions of the various projects, um, I, I think like the technology is a tremendous potential, right? And I, I think that it does, um, like having pioneered this um, has been, I think, very significant for Neutron as well. So maybe like to, to recap, right? Like, is it fair to say that on a high level, both replicated security, the atom economic zone and Inkadot 
they are going after the the same broad concept, which is let's build a a good validator set, and then get that validator set to to uh, to run multiple chains, so people can like kind of like launch their own chain and have already a validator set that can that can secure the chain easily. So on a high level, it's kind of aligned. But one of the big differences is that Polkadot came with the design of a grand city right at the right at inception. Right? I mean, if you go back 2017, there's a white paper detailing how that city will be built, how if you if you want to launch your own chain on it, what's what's going to be the process, how is security going to work, and then kind of they started with the with a very detailed design of the city and all of its suburbs. And then, then basically like in building the, in building the relay chain uh, and the para chain and the software there, they had the grand vision of the city and its suburbs already. And then they kind of tried to optimize the decision of all of the subcomponents so that the overall city and the kind of suburbs and also uh, work well, like in, in, in their view. Whereas, sort of like what the uh, approach Cosmos Hub has taken is is more evolutionary. The first kind of hey, let's let's build a let's build an app chain. Let's build an app chain and a framework to build an app chain. So that comes first, and then uh, that's Tendermint and Cosmos SDK. So that gets launched. Turns out that actually when that launches, a lot of people want to build these app chains, and fifty or seventy of these spring up organically. Then the next step is okay. How do these app chains communicate? So that's IBC, and it turns out okay, many of these app chains start to communicate, and now kind of like the Cosmos Hub is taking the third evolutionary step, which is okay. How can you duplicate the validator set across across two chains with the Cosmos Hub being the provider of the validator set and some other chain, Neutron in this case, be the consumer? Uh, at every step, it's kind of because it's evolving kind of step by step, it has the messiness of evolution where where, where the Neutron kind of gets on board. What's the economic model for it? Uh, nobody knows. Will the economic model end up centralizing the validator set? Nobody knows. It has the messiness of, of evolution, but it potentially may have the benefits of evolution as well that we might, the ecosystem might end up discovering categories of solutions to problems that a centrally planned city may may not have even considered. So do you see that as kind of being, being a good description? Yeah, I, I think there's some truth to that. Um, I mean, I, I would push back against, like, and I, I don't think that's what you said, but I would push back against the notion that these things are happening sort of like you know, just did at random, like, oh, we figured out that we needed to do this, or like even like biological mutations, right? Where it's like literally random, like that. That's not the case. But you're right in that it has been less of a centrally planned um, long-term vision that gets executed, where every component is optimized for the interest of the sort of like system as a whole, and it's more of a iterative process of like components themselves or like conducting themselves and making dis discoveries and improvement over time. Like this, I, I, I agree, I think is actually closer to the Cosmos philosophy anyway. Um, and I think the one of the one of the benefits of that approach, like uh, it's obvious the, the benefits of like the, the monolithic sort of like vision um, getting executed, the benefits of, of those are obvious. Like on the other hand, the benefits of like Cosmos's approach has been that it's a lot easier to actually onboard because the system itself imposes fewer constraints over what you want to build, right? And it's very difficult to plan ahead um, for everything that people will want to build and how that will actually work. And so by, you know, having a, a less, you know, systematized mechanism and just building um, sort of like the tools that people can then use to do whatever they want to do, um, that has allowed Cosmos to be a lot easier to onboard on and fit into the grander scheme of the ecosystem than 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 perhaps Polkadot has been, and I think that's true for replicated security as well, right? Whereby the the system to onboard to Polkadot is very formal, um, and that may you know work absolutely perfectly um, for specific types of projects, or even on average be very consistent and and sort of like efficient for the system as a whole. It may not actually work with some 
some chains, right? Like for example, um, I think you know, like one of the assumptions of the of the auction model uh, of Polkadot is that there will be significant crowd enthusiasm for the project because the crowd is what usually um, has to actually bootstrap the the amount of dot that is required to secure the slot, right? But how about let's say you know a uh, um, a chain that does a very niche but important piece of tooling or infrastructure for for developers, right? Like that's probably very useful for the commons, but it's actually very difficult to drive so like widespread enthusiasm for for that, right? So perhaps that would be um, kind of like one of the limitations of the model. Cosmos Hub and replicated security, on the other hand, um, are a lot less formal, and so that has you know obvious drawbacks of like it is possible to do things that don't actually make sense if we're not careful. Um, but at the same time, it does also offer some flexibility whereby something that is purely an infrastructure play could still happen pretty easily as long as it's um, as long as its value is justified to the commons, right? So sure, that would be added cost to the system, but if if the benefits of having that are demonstrated, then we can have it basically. Um, that that's not a like sort of like economic blocker to to get that in, into the into the overall system. So yeah, I would agree. I think like your your analogy is 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 pretty good actually. Right. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. And I think really only now many people start to realize what it means. I think actually also from our side, right, we were ones that like posted about these implications of running like these many chains. I think there's a lot to come in terms of, you know, how are we going to solve for that? Since I think, uh, you know, there's also no clear path right now. How do you actually offboard a, a consumer chain, especially like without there it? Is like, one. There is. It, it is very clear how that works. It is very clear how that works. There's, um, there's, I would say there's like, sort of like three layers of politeness that you can have in the order of boarding of, of a chain. Um, the base layer of politeness is not the issue here, uh, which I wouldn't argue for, but is technically possible. Is just, just like any other Cosmos chain, if a third of the voting power stops running that chain, then that chain just holds. But because the composition of its validator set is dictated by the hub, there is no way, unless the composition of the hub uh, changes that that chain will start running again, right? So that's that's a pretty strong signal that hey, we're not running your chain anymore. Like you, you can fork it and become your own sovereign chain if you want, but but that's not right. In general, that doesn't seem like a very good model to um, to follow because um, it you know there's like no protection here for the consumer chain, and so what that means is that you know taking on that risk is is going to be a, a barrier or a hurdle to the adoption of, of ICS, right? And ideally, you want I, ICS as a feature and as a, a sub-ecosystem that you can be a part of to be as attractive as possible so that you end up having, you know, really, really, really strong projects that you can select into rather than having just like, you know, whatever wh whatever chain comes up and then just being forced into selecting these because otherwise there is no demand for it for the feature, right? Um, and so in general, that that is probably not the right approach. The, the second approach is the Cosmos Hub could just make a proposal, hey, um, we're going to terminate your replicated security lease, right? It has the benefit of being a little bit more formal and a, to have a little bit more time for the consumer chain project to adapt um, because you have this like two weeks period where like for the voting, um, it is governance decided. So maybe it's going to get rejected, but it, it does send a strong signal. So it's already a lot more civil, let's say. Um, and it does give the project a little bit more chance to be able to actually transition um, in time. Now, still not ideal because it's a very short timeline to be moving your entire security, um, like from from basically being leased by another chain to being, you know, independent or sovereign. I think what's likely to be used in practice, what I would argue for, um, at least at this point, is probably this needs to be done by several proposals over a period of time, e.g. You know, there, there's some like social consensus going or, going on, and if um, you know the the the, the Cosmos of social consensus sorts of reach this tipping point where people are actually considering of boarding that consumer chain, they should make a signaling proposal that says, "Hey, um, if this proposal is accepted, then it will trigger a three months period during which the consumer chain should either come back with um, sort of like amended security um, security agreement that uh, might convince the Cosmos Hub that actually." Um, it should stay on with these new terms, basically re renegotiating the agreement, um, or it will be terminated after a another vote down the line that would actually be triggering the uh, the the removal of the consumer chain itself. And what that does is that 
The first vote is a signaling proposal and it materializes social consensus so that what was Twitter noises and, and conversations on Telegram um, becomes something that's actually measurable of the voting power of the Cosmos Hub. 65% think that um, that change should be aborted in three months unless they come back with a better agreement. And then it gives the, the consumer chain community a time to actually you know, reflect upon this. Are there alternatives that would be better suited for the, for the consumer chain? Are there a way to salvage the relationship with the hub in a way that is more mutually beneficial? You know, should the chain just become a, a sovereign app chain secured by its own token, for example? And these, like, it gives at least enough time to consider these ser seriously and for a few governance proposals on that chain as well to, to happen, right? Um, and then you have the confirmation vote that basically um, sort of like signals it, like that sorts of like does a temperature check again, but because there's so much time in between um, you know, what, like if the first proposal was triggered by something that is more emotional in nature or like market conditions, then at least you have some, some time to recover from this before it actually leads to, to drastic consequences. And the, the, the overall process is a lot more, um, civil so that if that's the sort of like commitment on the social layer of the Cosmos hub, then consumer chain projects know that, you know, worst case scenario, they'll, they'll get that signal that, Hey, they need to sort their shit out or the Cosmos hub is going to offboard them. Um, but at least they'll have time, whatever happens to, to react to it. Yeah, I do, I do find it quite interesting that Cosmos Hub going like for this very governance based currently, at least system. And then Polkadot is like sort of more a market based approach where, you know, you have that element of the dot being locked. And so through that, you sort of can signal, these are the most valuable chains, right? We have limited slots. Let's fill them with the most valuable chains. And, and you have that lease and it sort of takes away a lot of this governance overhead that is coming right now for, for Cosmos. So quite interesting to see how that can be. I agree, but I think it's very characteristic of Cosmos though. Like, you know, Cosmos basically baked governance in every sovereign app chain that, that actually launched into the ecosystem. And so, you know, that's, that's like one of the design patterns of Cosmos, I guess, whereby, you know, people are not completely removed from these computers, I guess. So, um, like I said, skiers, I try to get like a compare and contrast with something that's harder, which is, um, you know, like replicated security versus kind of like the modular blockchain stack, which is represented by Celestia and Ethereum. Potentially like a harder comparison to make, but nonetheless interesting. I mean, just to recap, right, like the modular stack is, is roughly the idea that you can think of what a chain does and you can decompose it into data availability, making sure transaction data is always available. Uh, sequencing or ordering where like transaction A follows transaction B and then kind of like logic and actual blockchain. And when you kind of divide across um, these functionalities, you can have systems where a, one chain does one part of the stack and another chain does another part of the stack and both kind of like Ethereum and Celestia kind of like going down this path. Whereas kind of Cosmos in replicated security, it's like probably like very similar chain designs and the entire validate, validator set is shared. You know, like kind of compare and contrast these two approaches and it's just strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's uh, it's a really interesting sort of like turn of events. I mean, when the Cosmos SDK was produced, um, it, you know, like the Cosmos SDK is a, is a software development kit that allows you to build monolithic blockchains because like modular blockchains weren't a concept that was coined by Celestia later on um, at the time that, that Cosmos was created, right? Now, there is some sort of modularity in spirit in the fact that like the idea is that cosmos can scale horizontally right um but indeed you don't get the sort of specialization and well you do get specialization but not specialization of the performance specifically that you do get with like especially celestia which is purpose built for modular blockchains i guess um, and so that, that makes it a very interesting ecosystem. But, you know, funnily enough, Celestia is actually part of the Cosmos like, ecosystem as well, right? Um, so it's sort of like an app chain that specializes in being the base layer for other blockchains to leverage um, their consensus and, and data availability. Now, what, what I think is likely to happen is that 
like these solutions are actually not exclusive. We're already seeing a trend where um, numerous projects in Cosmos are working on bringing um, rollups to the Cosmos stack. Um, you have like Dimension, for example. I, I believe they are sort of like they're probably live or soon to be live uh, right now, and they've sort of developed with the Cosmos SDK sort of like a platform that intends to be um, a settlement layer for application specific rollups, um, which is you know a very interesting idea. I know that there's a whole bunch of projects working on similar things in in the Celestia ecosystem, um, and that has now even sort of like leaked into uh, Ethereum ecosystem with the OP stack and Hyperchain from zk Sync. Um, so, I think what's interesting here at the fundamental level is that the idea that you can have one distributed computer, like like one blockchain, being tailored for one specific application or use case, um, ha- is actually finding some traction here. We're seeing this idea, which mostly started in Cosmos, kind of like grow into other ecosystems and being adopted and implemented by various technological stacks now. Um, so that that kind of like, I think that's a validation of the thesis of the AppChain thesis that Cosmos kind of like has been writing on. Uh, but it's also like, I, I also do think that there's a trap that a lot of folks um, in Cosmos consider that the AppChain thesis is everything should be a Cosmos SDK app chain. I don't think that that's true. I do think that the app chain thesis in that there are significant benefits for to be had by having infrastructure that is dedicated to one application. Um, like I think that thesis is true, but I think the the fact that everything should be in a Cosmos SDK app chain, that's likely to be proven false over time. And so what I think we're going to see in the ecosystem is that we're going to have so sort of like an hybridation between, you know, like rollups and modular ideas with sort of like app chains and horizontal scaling, the crush and interoperability technologies that Cosmos has has born and such. And so I think sort of like to Zaki's point in a pretty famous tweet now that he made a couple of um, weeks or months ago now, um, he said something to the point of Cosmos social capital has about 12 months to do something unique and differentiated before it gets swallowed by Ethereum variants of Cosmos ideas, essentially, right? And I, I think that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing that the idea of an app chain, e.g. dedicated blockchain for a dedicated application, is actually now um, something that is being worked on outside of the boundaries of Cosmos. And that creates sort of an existential threat to Cosmos because now that idea that has been like very fundamental um, to its development process is not, no longer exclusive to the ecosystem, but it also provides an opportunity because contrary to a lot of the other ecosystems that are now implementing these the, these ideas, Cosmos has been working on this for a long time. And so if it can, you know, leverage the existing work that it has completed with like IBC and such, and make that sort of like the most suitable standard for these new type of hybrid blockchains that we're seeing, uh, then it has a great chance, in my opinion, to, you know, be successful at setting one of the standards and therefore becoming a much more relevant ecosystem to the entire industry, essentially. Yeah, I don't see them as exclusive. I think I think they're kind of like really interesting trend in the industry that are actually complementary. Uh, to sort of like sum up. All right, super interesting. We've been going quite deep into interchain security, I think here, and comparing it. But I think yeah, it's, it's hopefully valuable to people that are not as familiar, and also uh, very interesting to hear your viewpoints. I think we can take it back a little bit to to neutral, maybe, and and cover like a few more things at the at the end since we've been going quite for a while, and then then wrap up soon. I think one interesting thing that we actually haven't really talked about is then sort of. Uh, neutron like token utility and kind of the, the the things you're doing around governance since now given you're running as an interchain secure chain right often the token model that cosmos sort of uh, established where you have the, the staking function and that sort of gives your token utility you have to now come up with like sort of another model essentially similar to i guess the problems that exist on ethereum already where a lot of the DAOs just come up like okay there's a governance token right i think uh, you are also working like interesting things there uh, with Neutron, the, with the modular governance. So maybe we can talk a few minutes about that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, like beyond just our interest in in you know like playing around with the governance in general, the the thing is like replicated security exists as a set of Cosmos SDK module that replace the modules that in like out, outside of replicated security are used for staking and governance, right? So using replicated security removes both of these modules. So basically you have to, as a consumer chain, you have you know a few alternatives. 
Um, one of them, the sort of like the default option that is proposed is usually to replace these by modules that essentially are pseudo staking, pseudo governance um, system, like, like modules, e.g. Um, you're going to have a token that is not Atom, which is, you know, Atom would be used for staking on your chain anyway, um, but you, you would have another token and that gets used to, you know, calculate voting power and you can delegate it to governors. They're not validators actually, but they're governors and they um, they can, you know, wield voting power on your behalf. Um, in the case of Neutron, it felt less sort of um, logical to go that route, given that, you know, the as, as a small contract platform, a lot of the innovation that Neutron wanted to do was around empowering and, and leveraging the modularity of of, of smart contracts, right? And so instead, what we did is we used a lot of the great work that had been done by the DAO DAO team on, um, on, you know, like on building DAO infrastructure, basically, and we baked it into the Genesis file so that there's a set of small contracts that exist at Genesis that constitute this um, sort of like governance infrastructure and made it able to control the network parameters itself through something that's called the admin module that's perhaps less interesting for this conversation uh, but so that you have like smart contracts on the chain that govern the chain eg they're able to trigger updates of the entire network they're able to change network parameters extra extra and the interesting thing about having been able to work with the DAO DAO for, like framework is that the you know not only does this allow you to have a functional um, decision-making process, e.g. you can have like single proposals, multi-choice proposal, you can have token voting, multi-sig style uh, things, like so you can already sort of like customize the main chamber, but more importantly, you your system itself, because there's like a library of code that can be pulled by the main DAO at any time to instantiate um, uh, new committees, new chambers, you basically have a, a governance system that is capable of like structuring itself. So you have the Agora, right, the token voting assembly, and then that has the power of creating new subcommittees that are dedicated to doing one 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 task or the other, and they can have their own, um, you know, like committee or like voting system or selection mechanism, their own resources, and the way that they execute um, changes to the rest of the chain um, can have you know customizable limitations. Like for example, one idea for a grand style would be that hey, one person can give grants up to $1,000 freely. And then 10, like, sorry, two person can give grants together if they agree up to $10,000, right? So I like having these sort of like customized, customizable limits. Um, and so that's that's one of the things you could do. In general, though, one of the sort of like baseline limitations that we've created that can be instantiated by that Agora is essentially when the subdao is created, it has a time lock module, which is so that when the sub DAO makes a decision through a vote, um, before that, you know, like which can be pretty fast compared to main DAO governance proposals, like that's a matter of a few hours or days, depending on the reactivity of the members. Um, when that gets approved, if that gets approved, it's time locked for three days, and it can be basically vetoed by the main DAO. And so what that means is that you can now have systems that are either you know like very large committees or multis or stuff that is more akin to a multisig that is independent from the main DAO, but still accountable to the main DAO. And if, um, you know, they betray the main DAO, essentially, if they're not aligned, the main DAO has mechanism to force them to fall back on the main governance track so that decisions that are, you know, negative to the network cannot be executed um, without, you know, a, a significantly higher lift of just like capturing the governance system itself. Right, right. I can hear a lot of the kind of ideas or concepts that are, exist at Lido actually here, right? Like with the uh, Lego and, and some of the yeah. the things that, that are actually much harder, I, I would say, probably to do in, in Ethereum because you don't have that, the customizability of, of a Cosmos app chain. So I think very exciting uh, to have like things more codified in Neutron here that are maybe like more on the social layer, essentially in, in Lido, I guess. Um, so yeah, really excited to see where that's going. I think we <laughs> covered a bunch of stuff. I hope um, we did justice to, to Neutron. We did definitely talk about a lot of like higher level things, but I think you're you're the right person to do that. So uh, we've been going for quite a while. So I think we were at a good spot to to wrap up. Maybe uh, for final question, uh, and you can like talk a little bit about you know your roadmap, uh, sort of the the ecosystem things you're doing. There, there's been recent announcement around the this accelerator maybe maybe you can talk a little bit about that and um then then we wrap up so from my side yeah thanks so much yeah, sure for let's let's wrap up all this actually that's 
<laughs> yeah, well, I mean, once again, thanks for having me. This was a this was a really fun conversation to have. Um, so yeah, I guess like one one last sort of like announcement or whatever. Um, you know, we talked during this this episode a lot about so like the structure of replicated security and and how it creates kind of like a sub ecosystem that benefits from being very deeply aligned and co collaborative. Um, that's something that we believe has really the potential to be tremendously valuable for both the Cosmos Hub and the consumer chains. Um, and so in an effort to sort of like further this, uh, we've teamed up with Longhash, but also the Atom uh, uh, Accelerator DAO in order to launch an, an accelerator program that is dedicated to that sub ecosystem, right? So that we can bring, um, like we can nurture teams that are building projects either as additional consumer chains or that are building on Neutron to join the Atom Economic Zone and provide them with funding, experience, you know, like like um, scaffolding in their sort of like development and strategy, um, so that you know they get the best chances of hitting the, the market in a in a really good shape and being very successful. Um, so if that's interesting to you, um, check out you know Neutron or um, Long Ash or Atom Accelerator DAO's Twitter and blog and blogs. You'll find the links to how to register there. Um, how to learn more about the project and, and such. Um, I think I'm, you know, I think it, it has a good chance of being pretty, pretty awesome for for the ecosystem. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to play, place that shell here at the end. You know, <laughs> yeah, very important. All right, yeah, thanks everyone for coming on, and uh, yeah, hope our listeners enjoy this this breakdown of interchain security and, and learn more about Neutron uh, in the show notes. Awesome, thanks, folks. Thanks for the great questions as well. <laughs>